Welcome to today's webinar on low-cost ways to preserve family archives. I'm Stephanie Lamson. On behalf of the Elects Continuing Education Committee and the Preservation Week Working Group, I'm happy to introduce this free webinar as part of ALA's Preservation Week. Many thanks to our sponsor for today's webinar, Archival Products. Our presenter today is Karen Brown. Karen is the Preservation Librarian for the University at Albany SUNY University Libraries, a position she has held since 2001. At SUNY Albany, she is responsible for managing the Preservation Laboratory and the repair and conservation of collections for the University Libraries, managing the Library's brittle and irreparable books program, and participating in emergency preparedness and response, environmental control, staff training, and other preventive preservation efforts. Karen holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Cooper Union in New York City and a Master's of Arts conservation, excuse me, a Master of Arts Conservation from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. After working for five years as a conservator for the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick in Fredericton, New Brunswick, she went on to complete her MLIS at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Prior to her position as Preservation Librarian at SUNY Albany, Karen was the Field Service Representative at the Northeast Document Conservation Center in Andover, Massachusetts. She is a member of the American Institute for Conservation and the American Library Association. Before I turn over the presentation to Karen, please note that today's presentation will be recorded and available at the Lex webinar website and on YouTube. You're also invited to use the Twitter back channel, hashtag AlexCE, to interact with other participants during the webinar. However, please submit questions for us in the question box on the screen. We will not monitor Twitter during the presentation. So with that, I'll turn the program over to Karen. There may be a short pause. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all joining us today for this special Preservation Week webinar. In today's session, we are going to focus on the care and preservation of family archives, books, papers, photographs, etc. However, much of what we will cover can be applied to other types of collections you might have in your homes or smaller cultural organizations. The emphasis in preservation programs in libraries, archives, and museums is exactly what it should be for family collections as well, prevention preventing damage from happening in the first place. This is the most effective way of ensuring that we have collections for as long as possible. It's also much less expensive to prevent harm than to try to repair or restore valued holdings once damage has been done. A lot of what we're going to cover today is common sense. The goals will be to help you understand the importance of good storage and careful handling in preventing damage and to learn about low-cost, no-cost options for minimizing risks to your collections. We all sometimes wonder why we're keeping all that stuff. Paperwork we've put in folders and labeled, maybe organized into boxes or stashed on shelves, photos we've collected over the years, or that got passed down from parents and grandparents. There are books and Bibles and scrapbooks, newspaper clippings, postcards, children's drawings, letters from our lives or from generations before us, and we treasure them. And we want to be able to share them with our friends, our families, our children, and maybe even our communities. Most everyone has family archives, and they are important. They tell the story of who we are and they give future generations a record of where they came from. I was recently asked to consult on what to do with a great-grandmother's diary. It was written between 1910 and 1930 in the town of Corinth in upstate New York. It was very brittle, and the owner couldn't keep it, and she didn't have anyone to pass it down to. The decision then was to donate, do, to donate the diary to a well-run Folk Life Center that had good storage and access policies in a community near where the diary was written. This item from her family archives has not just personal value, it, like many items in family collections, 
also tells the story of our communities. And I had to laugh looking at it. A lot of it had to do with the weather and what the neighbors were doing. But in sum, when you donate personal or family papers and collections to an archives, your family history becomes part of your community's history and America's collective memory. Before we get too far, I want to characterize what I mean when I say family archives. First of all, an archive is a place where people go to find information. But it's also a collection of letters, reports, notes, memos, photographs, film, and other usually original, first-hand, or primary materials. These archives provide evidence, data, facts, or information about the person or persons that created them. And these collections have value. Family archives can have sentimental value, for example, like a dance card when your grandparents were still dating. They can have legal value, like discharge or immigration papers, and or financial value, such as a deed on a parcel of land. What you have in your family archives often serves as proof that some event occurred, and they may even explain how something happened. Today, we're going to focus on more traditional materials as a complement to Mike Ashenfelder's presentation given last year for Preservation Week titled, Personal Digital Archiving. I've listed the URL on your slide. I recommend when you go to look at it that you view the YouTube recording so you get both the slides and the audio. Also, I want to recommend a book to you titled, Personal Archiving, Preserving Our Digital Heritage, edited by Donald T. Hawkins. And this will give you more detail than you'll get uh, from the, uh, if you want to go further into the topic. Let's talk a little bit about organizing those family papers before we go into the preservation side of it. I really can't stress enough the importance of organizing family papers. It may take consulting with many others to figure it out, to figure out what it is you're looking at, but that can really be the best part of the process. And I wanted to give you a few tips. For example, with photographs, you want to try to identify who it is that's in the photo, when, and even where it was taken. With letters, you will want to try to figure out not only who wrote the letter, but also who received it. I recommend you don't take any notes on that original document. Write on a separate sheet of good quality paper that you keep um, in the file or enclosure with the original, or you can write on the enclosure itself, if that's possible. Include any other information you might think is relevant, relevant like what the letter might be about. If you do want to make notes on, the, on that original, please keep those notes very small, light-handed, and written in pencil only, no ink and no stickers. Whenever possible, respect the order in which the collections are created. That could be chronologically, organized by the person that created it, or maybe even by the type of material that you have, like receipts or po postcards or maps. You might want to organize and keep them separately. By organizing and labeling, you can avoid letting the material get scattered or misidentified. We have three poll questions planned for you today. The first one is up on the screen now. Well, it'll be up on the screen in a minute. Eva, our technician, is going to take care of that. There it goes. OK. Our first poll question is a pause, just for a minute, so that we can all get a sense of what we have that we want to preserve. So the question is, what do you have that represent your family archives that you plan to preserve? And we'll ask you to check all that apply. So the first option would be books, scrapbooks, diaries, and pamphlets. The second option, documents such as letters, deeds, or marriage certificates. The third option is newspapers and newspaper clippings. The fourth option, photographs, prints, slides, negatives, film. And the last option would be audio-video, so moving picture film, discs, cassettes, or reel-to-reel. -reel. 
So we'll ask everyone now to answer the poll, and I'm going to watch the results. And we'll see what we get. We're going to just let it go for a minute. About 80% of you have voted. Oh, it's still going up a little bit. All right, we'll give it a few more minutes, a few more moments, I mean. All right. Okay. All right. Okay, so I think we'll stop the poll there. Good. All right, thank you. So from what I can see, 99% of the people that voted on this poll have photographs, and that's, that's the biggest category, so print, slides, negatives. And then from there, the next biggest group, 89%, have got documents. 76% um, have books, 77% newspapers. And only 64% audio video. So that surprises me. I thought maybe there'd be more. So um, you all have a lot of stuff. And as I expected, quite a variation. All right, let's move on. So by way of organizing today's webinar, um, I thought that there were actually just a few simple categories um, that sort of describe the major ways that you can protect collections. The most important one is to control the environment, temperature, humidity, light, and pollution like dirt and dust. Second, using the right type of enclosures to protect and help safely store what you have. The third category is careful limited handling. And in this, that implies that if you create copies, you can prevent unnecessary handling and damage of fragile originals. And then today, before we get to the end, we'll talk a little bit about protecting family archives against emergencies. Before we talk about the environment, I want us all to think about our homes and our stuff and ask, our, ask ourselves, where are you storing your family archives? Where are you currently storing your family archives? So the poll is open, and we're going to ask again that everyone check all that apply. The first option is in an attic. The second is in a basement or garage. The third would be in the main part of a house or apartment. The fourth option, off-site storage, such as a huge storage vault or even safety deposit box. And the last is other, because I wondered if maybe I missed something. So people could please go ahead in and vote, and we'll, we'll, let it, we'll keep it open until we see we've got a good majority of people that have voted. And be honest, just really think if there's this, this nobody else is going to know, I'm not going to tell on you. Just want to get an idea from the group so that when we move into this, you know, I have a better idea, you know, what you're doing and you've had a chance to sort of think about your stuff. All right, I think that we're going to close the poll there. We've got 88% of you have voted. 94% of you are keeping your collections in the main part of your house or apartment. 35% in a basement or garage, 16% off-site, 13% in an attic, and 8% would be other. And I wonder what that other is. Maybe people can you know, let us know later. I, I, I don't want to know if you're keeping it in the trunk of your car. All right, I think that we're going to move on to the next slide. Thank you, Eva. So let's first speak about the environment. I want to look at the two biggest environmental risks to collections, temperature and humidity, RH meaning relative humidity because humidity levels are related to temperature levels. Hot air can hold more moisture. If collections are stored or displayed in a place that is always very warm, the rate of deterioration increases. In fact, for every 10 degree rise in temperature, the rate of decay is doubled. 
something you could have had for 50 years will maybe only be usable for another 25 if you tend to keep your thermostats set 10 degrees warmer than the way the cat likes it. Humidity is also a problem and harder to control in the home as most of us don't have any central control of this during the winter months. But the extremes are what you really need to avoid. You have to know that sustained high humidity levels can promote mold growth and even cause swelling. And this would be summer conditions where you're not treating the air with an air cooling unit. And sustained low humidity levels can dry out leathers and adhesives. And this would be typical when you've got um, winter conditions and the indoor heat is on. Thinking about damp spaces just as a sideline, remember also that some pests prefer spaces that are damp. So by controlling this, you also can reduce the chance that you'll have bugs. I put up ideal conditions for you. Collections are stored where the environment is cool, 60 to 65 degrees, and dry, 30 to 40 percent relative humidity. Well, that seems very, very hard to attain. So we want to think practically. Every small change that you can make can make a big difference. So what little you can do, you should try to do it and don't give up. The question is, how do you do it in a home environment? As far as I can see, I think the simplest solutions take into account where in your house or apartment or building you're storing your collections. Basements and attics can be risky areas for storage of family archives. Basements are notoriously damp, they can be buggy, and there might be problems with flooding and leaks from overhead pipes or from rising damp and water. Attics have been known to be fine places for squirrels and bats and mice to set up light housekeeping, and they tend to get very, very hot during the summer months in most parts of the U.S. I don't get into my attic very often, and there's always a chance there could be a leak or other problem that could go undetected for quite a long time, putting anything stored up there at further risk. So you should avoid storage in basements and attics if you can. The second low-cost solution would be to use enclosures, especially board and paper products and cabinets and furniture. These enclosures protect collections against sudden changes in the environment. If you think about it, the central part of a home is usually the best place to store family archives. In a drawer, under a bed, in a box, of course. Much better than storing in garages and attics and basements and new storage. Again, as a 2-4, simple repairs like sealing cracks and crevices and windows can save you energy, protect against leaks and storm damage, and also help stabilize your environment and protect your collection. I suggest, if you can, that you lower your thermostat uh, during the winter months. I keep mine quite cool, 62 degrees, although most of you would consider 72 to 74 to be human comfort levels. If you have rooms in your home on separate thermostats, consider storing your family collections in one, in one space where the temperatures can be lowered, away from where you typically spend your active time. A few other simple ideas that can save you money and protect your collections um, have been listed, but these aren't as cheap as just lowering a thermostat in the winter. I suggest using insulated curtains to help stabilize collections. They can block hot sun in summer and minimize winter drafts. It's also possible to have a company come and install window films that will reduce radiant heating and limit UV light from natural light. If properly installed, you won't even know it's there. Your rugs and furniture, as well as your books and artwork, will thank you. Note that blocking the heat of the sun will also help you reduce your energy bill during the summer months if you're running an air conditioning unit. Installing a dehumidifier can help control moisture in damp air areas. It can have some good effect. Just remember that the bucket has to be empty so the machine will actually operate unless you set it up to automatically drain. Also remember, if you use it in a small space, it will heat that space up. 
So it may not be something you want to do. A lot of people in the U.S. use air conditioning during the summer months or longer. Using air conditioning to control temperature and humidity will also extend the useful life of your collections. Be sure that the unit that you, that you have, um, especially if it's sitting in a window, is properly sized to the space that you are treating. The area in square feet needs to be lined up with the capacity in BTUs per hour. EnergyStar.gov has charts online that will help you in purchasing the right unit for your needs. An oversized unit is actually less, less effective and wastes energy at the same time. Air conditioners remove both heat and humidity from the air. If the unit is too large, it will cool the room quickly, but only remove some of the humidity. This leaves the room with a damp, clammy feeling. A properly sized unit will remove humidity effectively as it cools. The next risk I want to speak about today is from light. All types of light, including visible light, the spectrum in which we see the world around us, and UV light at the shorter end of the spectrum can be damaging to collections. UV light has more energy, so it can cause damage faster, but you need to protect your collections from both. There are two factors to consider, intensity and duration. Brighter light means higher intensity, and duration is the amount of time an item is exposed. Both influence the rate of deterioration of collections. So you want to lower the light and limit exposure whenever possible, especially in the, if the object in question is more susceptible to damage. Examples are watercolors, pastels, and textiles. These are notorious for fading quickly, as many, and many of those dyes and pigments can fade and cause your item to change color in a very short period of time. Paper objects can become yellow or discolor brown and lose strength. Light is also a source of heat. And as we just went over, even the small lights inside your china closet or spotlighting a special print can cause damage. The degradation caused by light energy cannot be reversed, and it's permanent. So if your watercolor or inks in a letter fade from light damage, it cannot be undone. Again, the goal has to be prevention. The low-cost solution that I believe is one of the best investments you can take to protect family collections on display is to use curtains and blinds in a systematic way. Keep those lights out off when no one's around. And framed work should be hung in the home away from direct sources of natural light. And while compact fluorescent lamps are a good idea in terms of energy savings, these, like all fluorescent lights, have a UV component that will damage your materials faster than incandescent lights or LED lighting, so they should be avoided. There are filtering tubes and panels that you can and should use if fluorescent lighting is your only option. Also, you can frame works of art using something known as UV filtering plexiglass, but actually it's pretty expensive, and I understand the protection it affords isn't forever. Your better bet is to display sensitive material where the sun won't be incident on it at any time during the day. Again, avoid the use of display lighting and use low wattage bulbs with dimmers whenever possible. If there's something like a watercolor or a needlework that you want to display, um, don't leave it out all the time. While some materials like prints or old silver gelatin photographs are much more light stable, you want to watch for inks that might fade or hand coloring that um, is also especially sensitive. If you're in a small organization and you display books, um, I always suggest if that book is displayed open that every couple of days you turn the page so that there's one, those two pages aren't always being exposed to light. I strongly recommend whenever possible that you make a copy of your family treasures and frame these for display and store the originals in the dark. Scanning and printing technology allows us to make copies that are very, very good at relatively low cost. This is something that museums, archives, and libraries do all the time.
The next risk, pollution or controlling dirt and dust, especially in the home, it takes some diligence. But it's impo important to protect collections from particulate debris to prevent damage. And it's sometimes as easy as keeping them covered or in an enclosure. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. There are a number of reasons for this. Dirt and dust can get embedded into the surfaces of materials and be very difficult to remove. They can scratch sensitive surfaces on photographs or silkscreen prints. And dust and dirt can be acidic and cause premature decay. Note, too, that maybe not to us, but dust and dirt for bugs and molds um, are a source of food. So you don't want to provide any kind of source of a problem like this if you can avoid it. Let's talk about some low-cost solutions to control dust and dirt. Keeping your space clean means dusting and vacuuming. I like to use a microfiber cloth to do my dusting. You can buy them in the grocery store. They don't have any kind of chemicals in them, and they pick up dust without redistributing it. They can be washed and reused. I recommend you use a HEPA vacuum, a high-efficiency particulate air HEPA vacuum so that the finest dust and dirt stay in your vacuum and don't go back through the exhaust, especially particles like mold spore. Use enclosures like boxes and envelopes to keep dust and dirt off of the collections. And finally, be sure your heating system is properly filtered and that the windows are screened. We have one more poll question for you today. Before we move on, I want to ask everyone to pause and think about, where, about how we're storing our collections. So I've asked you to characterize how your physical family archives are currently being stored, and please check all that apply. The first option is to say that they're organized and stored properly in a few known locations. Second, sort of organized, stored pretty well. Third, not very organized, but you know where most of it is. Fourth, it's a mess, and one day you hope to get it organized. And finally, maybe you've got your material in albums and scrapbooks or framed and on display. So we'll give everyone a chance to vote. See, 70% of you have voted. Again, this isn't a test. Just want to get a sense of, you know, what you've got and want to see, you know, um, people thinking about what, you know, thinking back to what they have and what they're trying to improve. All right, we're just about ready to close. We've got about, let's see, 86. All right, I think we'll close it now. We've got 87% um, of you have voted. And 57% of it, you said, not very organized, but you know where most of it is. That's pretty good. OK, 38% of you in scrapbooks and albums or framed. That's good. We're going to give you some information on, on that today. And 37% of you said, sort of organized and stored pretty well. Hey, I'm proud of you. 30% um, said it's a mess, and one day you hope to get it organized. We've got some people who are honest. And um, at 13%, this is great, said that they're organized and stored in a few known locations. And uh, that's great. And I wish you could uh, come and do mine for me. All right, let's move on. Um, I'm going to uh, look at different types of collection materials that you all have in your family archives one by one. But first, I thought it would be useful uh, to go over a few tips for actually using your collection. Remember that pressure-sensitive tapes, even if they say archival, can damage your collection. It should be avoided at all times. You need to consult a specialist if you really, really feel that an item has to be repaired. In some cases, making a used copy and keeping the original in a plastic sleeve may be a very good solution. If you have a folder full of mixed items and it also contains an old fax or newspaper clippings, both of which are highly acidic, you need to segregate these items in their own enclosure 
or maybe interleave with good quality paper so they don't discolor and damage things that are stored next to them. Avoid the use of clips and pins as these can damage and dent surfaces. And some paper clips can actually cause rust, which is very difficult and impossible to remove. And rubber bands just get old and fall apart, and it can be difficult to remove those residues left behind. Of course, using your collection in an area that is clean and uncluttered with clean hands like we do in the archives will prevent acids and dirt from transferring to your treasures. Let's think about books for a minute. Since this is something we all have, whether it's just a few in your archives or a collection um, that has some value to your whole family and maybe someday to your community or public library. Keep them shelved upright and fully supported, meaning you have to use good sturdy bookends so they stand up straight and tall. Oversized books can be shelved spine down, not spine up, so that paper text block is actually supported inside the covers. Or with your oversized books, you can store them flat if you have a space. Keep that stack to no more than three books or six inches in a stack to prevent handling damage. Don't pull books off the shelf by the head cap or the tail cap. Push the books on either side back just a little bit. Then grasp the book that you want by the sides with your hand and gently pull it towards you. Your fragile books should really be stored in some kind of an enclosure like a fitted box. Purchase these and all your enclosures from a reputable company such as Archival Products. Never fold over corners or mark a place in a book, to mark a place in a book, and never leave a bookmark in the book for longer than necessary. Avoid post-it notes as these can become difficult or impossible to remove after a while. And please keep your books stored closed. Never open face up or down in stacks. Now I'm going to stop, talk about storing documents. Many of you probably have um, a lot of paper documents in your family archives, and there are a variety of ways of storing them properly. With documents in particular, I want you to think in terms of layers of protection. The furniture or box is the first layer. The folder would be your second layer. And folders are really important because they can help you keep your collection organized. And then the third layer would be down to the item level. So you might have an individual piece in your collection that needs a little more support or protection, needing its own envelope or sleeve. Let's start with the outside layer. You can choose to store your family archives in a file cabinet or in a good quality box. I like file cabinets with hanging files fitted with labeled folders, filled with labeled folders. This is the best system for home collections because the objects in the files don't slump and become misshapen. File cabinets do take up more space than boxes, so boxes may be a better bet for some of you. Always use the best quality folders that you can afford that are in direct contact with your collection material. You can use regular quality ones for the hanging files because they're not in contact, and that'll help you control costs. Box with, boxes with fitted lids are also a very good option for document storage, but you need to make sure that you use spaces so folders don't slump if the box is underfilled, and don't overfill them either. When you're shopping for enclosures, purchase only from reputable suppliers. For paper and board, you want to look for indicators of quality. So you're going to look at the catalog descriptions for terms such as acid-free, meaning the paper is at least neutral, there's no acid. Other terms might be lignin-free, a sign that it won't get acidic quickly, or permanent, meaning it's meeting a permanent paper standard. There's also the term buffered, which means that the paper is slightly basic. And permanent paper always has a buffer. So it will last longer than other options as it ages naturally, because as things age naturally, they do become acidic over time. Don't use buffered products with anything that might be color sensitive, like blueprints. Rag or museum are terms that you might also see. If you are working with your framer, these would be the best indicators of quality for your mat board and backing. 
plastic is very complicated and very difficult. But there are three types here um, that would be considered safe for your archival collections in most instances. I would just say avoid anything that has a funny smell. And if you can smell it, you don't want to use it. Whether paper or plastic, but even more so with paper, use a folder, one that opens and closes like a book, instead of an envelope. So you avoid damage from pushing things into or pulling them out of those envelopes. Let's talk a little bit about photographs. Photographs are especially sensitive to damage from poor quality enclosures because they're created using a chemical process. When you're looking at catalogs or shopping for enclosures online, you should always look for enclosures that have passed the PAT, Photographic Activity Test, and I've given you the link on the screen. So you're, if you're organizing a collection of photographs, this is the kind of enclosure you want to look for. Some photograph collections may benefit from enclosing individual items in their own enclosure. And if this is what you choose to do, I suggest you use plastic first, preferably polyester, inserted inside a paper envelope. Now that may not sound cheap, but this way you can label the paper envelope or sleeve with a pencil and handle and view the actual photograph without taking out of the plastic so it protects it from the oils on your hands. Very neat solution. Use paper if you need to store photographs in a less than perfect environment where high humidity can be a concern as they can get sticky and adhere to the plastic. And if you have or prefer to use scrapbooks, avoid anything that describes itself as self-adhesive or magnetic. Instead, use an album made with good quality board and paper and use mounting corners. They seem kind of old-fashioned, but these will hold the images in place without having to use any kinds of glues or adhesives in contact with your object. Um, also, this will allow you to remove the images easily, which for some of you might be a good thing. And then people have different kinds of photographs. There are so many different formats. We just wouldn't have the time here to go into all of them. But generally speaking, if you have albums that have been passed down to you, I always recommend you try to keep them the way they are if you can, just to keep them stored in a properly sized box. Whoever created the album had an idea about the order and arrangement, and you don't want to lose that. If you feel like your family album or scrapbook is unusable, please consult a specialist for ideas about disassembling the album so you don't cause unnecessary damage. If you have cased photo type photos, like old tintypes or daguerreotypes, please keep them in their original case. Don't be tempted to pry them apart. They are sealed, and if the seal breaks, silver images will react to the air and deteriorate. Also, please be sure to segregate anything that smells funny, maybe some old photographs, or old negatives, I mean. This is a sign of deterioration, and it's something that you're going to want to make copies from. So find a specialist to help you. Anything broken should have individual pieces wrapped for storage. Some of you may have oversized collections, and these are always problematic. It's easy to tell people to store something flat, which is preferred, but for many of us, that's not possible in a home environment. If you do have a lot of oversized stuff, like prints or newspapers or maps, my advice is to store it flat in a box or even a set of flat files if you have the room for them. Of course, that won't be cheap, but I still have to recommend it. If you have newspapers, refold them along the original center fold with the edges aligned. Avoid putting any extra folds, as this can often mean that you'll break the paper fibers. Stack them in chronological order to prevent people from rooting around. If you do need to roll oversized documents or even textiles, I su suggest you try the double tube method. Roll them around a tube from your archival supplier, wrap that in tissue, and tie it in place. Then store that in a larger diameter tube capped at both ends, and this will keep out the dirt and dust. And in the end, the package that you have, you'll prevent your object from becoming crushed, which so easily happens with things that we try to store rolled. 
audiovisual stuff. Well, not a very professional title, but there are just so many formats, and they can be very, very difficult to deal with um, because sometimes the media just doesn't it just doesn't hold up the way paper does. But I wanted to give you a few ideas for at least protecting them from unnecessary handling damage. Um, handling is very important. Always handle these materials by their edges and store them upright to keep them from becoming deformed. And keep tape heads clean if you're running cassette or magnetic reel-to-reel. -reel. If you have something that doesn't want to play, that sounds really bad, chances are it's starting to deteriorate. And this is especially true for mag magnetic media like cassettes and videotape. You may be able to find someone locally who can help you copy your older formats onto something new. My last two slides before we look at emergency planning is about framing, mostly because I am often concerned that folks believe that in framing something, they're actually preserving it, but this is often not the case. If you use poor quality adhesives, matting or backing, and then you expose your treasure to too much light, you're causing way more damage than if you had held it in a box somewhere else. If you do decide to frame, you should be able to work with your framer so they know what you expect. Always use 100% cotton mats and mounting boards. Rag or museum are the terms you're going to see. And I suggest you always use a window mat so your artwork or photo or textile or letter isn't in contact with the glass. And I have a few more other tips. No pressure sensitive or tape or should be allowed in contact with your object. Be sure your framer and that you understand that you shouldn't be trimming or folding your originals so they can fit into the frame. Don't let your framer clean an original, and certainly if you've got a pastel, you don't them when using any spray fixatives on it. Keep all original labels from the back or inside of your original frame if you think it might help you know um, a little bit more of the history of your object. You may want to be the one that disassembles and reassembles your artwork so you know what you have and what you're getting. That depends on your comfort level. level. If you have questions or doubts or need design ideas, you might want to consult with a specialist, like a conservator. They may also be able to assist you with the actual framing. And where you choose to display that framed art item is also um, something to be very thoughtful of. The environment in interior rooms is usually more stable than those with outside walls. So that's where you want to put your work. Avoid displaying your work anywhere near heat vents, radiators, or fireplaces. And often, mantel pieces are where we want to put stuff and not always the best place to put things on display. Don't hang your valuables on outside walls because moisture can condense behind your artwork and leave you with mold damage. Again, your best option is to frame a copy and store the original for long-term safekeeping. Oh no, a pop quiz. I'm sure you were all afraid I was going to do this to you. OK, this time you only get one answer. We want to see what you've picked up today's seminar so far today. We want to ask you, what is the best way to store paper documents? And choose only one answer. So your first option is labeled with permanent ink and folded into envelopes, in acid-free folders in a record storage box. Your third choice is in a sealed plastic bag in the basement where it's cooler, or in file folders in a file cabinet someplace warm. Go ahead and vote. We're watching. Very good. OK, we're almost ready to close. We've got 83% voted, 84. All right, Eva, I think we can close the tally. Thank you, everybody. Well, I'm so proud of you. I see that 96% of you selected the correct answer, which is the second option, in acid-free folders and a record storage box. I didn't get anybody on the first or the third option, but I got a few of you on the last one. And you're right, in file folders and a file cabinet, it's wonderful, but storing it someplace warm would probably not be the best option. But I'm really proud of you. That's terrific. 
let's move on. We have just a couple more slides, and then we're going to open the floor for questions. Well, we know, you know, when something bad happens that you can't take everything, and not everything, really, has to be saved at all costs. Families and family archives need to think about what we call vital records, the ones that you will need to protect, the ones that you'll need to protect your rights, secure your health, or document your financial assets in the event of an emergency like fire or flood. Do you have legal records that you need to protect? or historically important records that document your family's assets or property? What sentimental items would you never, ever want to lose? You should make copies of what you consider vital in print or e-form and store them elsewhere besides in your home. A safety deposit box, somewhere secure in your place of work, in the home of another family member maybe, or even someone not in your geographic area if you're at risk of area-wide emergencies like hurricanes or earthquakes. The vital records you do have should be segregated and put in a grab and go pack so when you don't have the time and you aren't thinking straight anyway, all you know that you need to do is get that box that you've set aside and get it to safety if you can. And if your collections do get damaged, know that anything wet or, and that you decide to keep will have to be air dried or possibly frozen within 48 hours or you could get mold damage. Frozen items can be thawed out and dried later when you have the time and the situation is under control. Some things that are muddy can be washed if you have clean water, um, but you can also leave the mud in place and deal with it later. Preventing damage is always the best way when you store and use family archives, but if something happens and you need to recover cover and repair, always consult a conservator if you need advice or assistance in stabilizing your treasures. And that's it. I hope this presentation has helped you understand the importance of good storage and careful handling in preventing damage and that the low cost, no cost options I've outlined today for minimizing risks to your collections will prove useful to you. So I believe now um, we're going to be um, looking at questions in the question box. Yep, and everybody, if you haven't asked a question yet and you would like to, go ahead and enter it into the question box now that you should be able to see on your screen. Let's start with, let's see, um, in terms of Karen, you had asked the question about an, an other storage place. Uh -huh. Actually, the most popular other was a barn. A so, barn. Okay. So you can add that to your list. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> barn storage. Well, it doesn't sound like it would be a very good option, but I understand why people do it. If yes. you have materials that are, um, you know, if you have metals, for example, they can often be stored you know, quite nicely in a dry area. And some things that are normally kept outside um, might be fine in a barn. Uh, but I wouldn't put documents and papers in there. OK, and someone asked the question, if a basement is nicely finished into a living area, is it still unsuitable? Um, it may be just fine if it's a finished basement. Um, my home is on a slab, and I do have some problems with rising damp. I would recommend that you look through some of the archival catalogs and purchase yourself a good quality um, hygrothermograph to put in the home. And a hygrothermograph, something that you can actually look at that will tell you what the temperature and humidity are. There are some that will record the data, but if your conditions down there are, uh, aren't getting too damp in the summer, which seems to be the biggest problem with basements is that rising damp. Um, uh, then I wouldn't suggest it, but you can tell for everybody can tell for their own situation if they purchase a little a little hygrothermograph and put it somewhere in the center of the room so they know what the conditions are. Okay, and next question is, um, someone wondered if you could put up the slide um, from the beginning of your presentation with the URL to the digital archives. Um, 
or preserving your digital information. Okay. Webinar, I believe, and maybe the book too. Okay. Is that the one? That's the one, I think. Okay, I'll leave that up. And I have some more resources at the end that people can get to uh, after the presentation when it goes online. Okay. Okay. Our next question is, what is the best way to preserve an original magazine that is over 50 years old? Um, well, I, I hope that um, it's been stored flat. Um, I would probably store it just like anything else uh, that um, is, is paper format. So put it in its own enclosure. I think with a magazine, I would probably suggest um, something that will keep it closed and uh, store it flat someplace uh, out of the light. Um, if it's just one magazine, Believe it or not, if you could keep it in the bottom of a clothing drawer, if it's only one thing, it's sometimes the most stable part of, uh, part of your home. So next question is, is there a film that can be put over the glass from a photograph and or painting's frame to protect the image from light damage? Um, you, can, you can buy UV filtering film um, it's actually a polyester film. It has a very, very slight yellow tint to it. It's not terribly expensive. Some of the archival suppliers sell it by the roll. Um, you, you have to actually put it inside the, the frame. If you put it on the outside, you'll see it because it doesn't, it doesn't adhere to the glass. Um, it, it, it is possible. It's a little less expensive than a plexiglass. Um, I would suggest you probably work with a framer or somebody that's handy with framing um, if you want to try it. Okay, and there's a couple questions actually about um, rolled objects and what to do. One person was asking about a First Communion certificate um, that she wanted to encapsulate in mylar but wanted to put something on the backside when unrolling it. Others asking about old pictures rolled up and how do you unroll them. Okay. Folded notes to flatten. So there's a bunch of those. Okay. So we have a lot of questions. People have got rolled objects. They're having a hard time unrolling. and folded objects that are obviously deformed or maybe crimp, crimped up and crumpled. Opening up rolled objects, especially those that have been rolled for a really long time, um, can be hard to do. And if, and if you try to force it, you often will break it. And that's really a shame. You don't want that to happen. Um, for the home environment, the first thing that I would suggest is to use the better, use, use the warm, damp months to your advantage. And sometimes if the environment is warm and damp, you can gently tease something open little by little over the course of weeks. And you just sort of want to put one edge down and then slowly creep it open using some gentle weights. Um, uh, it, it, that might work for you, but never try to force it. If it's not opening up, then, um, um, then leave it. And you probably want to go to your local library or archives or museum to see if there's a preservation specialist there that can, that can assist you. If you've got a letter or a document that's been folded, unfold it to its full dimensions, lightly weight it with just you know some good quality paper and just a few things on the corner, and leave that out during that warm, damp weather. And that might also be just enough that you can get it to stay open. So next question was, if we need to consult a conservator, where do we find one? Oh, well, um, the American Institute for Conservation has a website. You can just Google that online. They have a tool for finding someone in your region. I also suggest you call your local public library. Um, if there's a large university, you could call them and see if they have anybody you can speak to. State libraries, state museums historical societies, they may be able to point you in the right direction as well. Okay, and Amy asks if you can provide examples of adhesives that are not pressure sensitive. For instance, when you want to mount something, what should we use? Okay, so right in contact with your object, you want to avoid pressure sensitive adhesives. Um, the 
the only really safe thing that conservators are going to recommend is something called wheat starch paste. And it's not hard to make. I think you can get online and find information about how to prepare it. And you just want to use good water, like distilled water from a bottle from the grocery store. Um, and, um, and the wheat paste can even be purchased at health food stores, but also from your archival suppliers. And it's very simply prepared. And it sets up. And you just thin that with a lot, little bit of water. It doesn't stick to everything. And it's not really, really strong. Um, there are good, what they call PVA, polyvinyl acetate adhesives. It's sort of Elmer's glue, but Elmer's glue's got a lot of other junk in it that you don't want to introduce. Um, I would say try to avoid using any kind of adhesive, adhesive if you can. And if you do need to use some adhesive, try to use something really, really simple and reversible, like, a, uh, like something that's water-based, like wheat starch or um, uh, some, something that's that's sort of that's any that's that's reversible. That's what you really want to work work towards. Um, some people are asking. Let's see about. Sorry, there's a lot of questions. I'm trying to find the one that will answer Thank them. You. Most people answer <laughs> it once. Um, how about? One person's asking, are Rubbermaid storage containers good for file storage or collection well, storage? You know, I think they would be OK, but they're not designed to hold things properly. So a properly sized box or file cabinet is actually designed for record storage. Um, I think you can use them. It, it's not a really good substitute for a good environment, but I don't, um, I don't have any objection to them, no. Your grab-and-go container, you may want to consider using something that's actually sealed like that, uh, depending on where you live. OK, another person, a couple of people are asking about storing film negatives, if you have advice as to how to store film negatives. Well, I'm not sure what format they have. Most of what I have is 35 millimeter. Uh, most of the negative sleeves or um, that, that you can buy or hopefully can still buy are are fine and you wouldn't really have to they're they're all pretty good quality people may have the negatives uh, stored in the original packet that their color prints came from like from Kodak when we used to send it out um, if they're not in sleeves then they should be stored in sleeves but I don't let them get too far away from the photographs themselves um, because um, you could lose them and things could get uh, uh, disorganized. But there are, there are polyethylene negative sleeves that you could buy. You could slip them in and you can label that sleeve and just put it back with your photographs, keep them together. OK, let's see. I see many products, Andrea asks, I see many products in stores labeled archival. What does that mean? Well, I'm afraid to say archival doesn't really mean anything. It, 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 it could be better quality, but it may not be. So you want to look for other indicators of quality. So again, if it's plastic, you know, I want you to smell it. If it says archival and it doesn't say anything on it anywhere, like it meets a permanent paper standard, or that it contains 50% cotton fiber, or that it's acid-free, or has a buffering agent, then archival doesn't really tell you anything. And I'm sorry that it can be so confusing. If you're buying from one of the um, one of the big suppliers like Archival Products, and there's many others, you can call and talk to the people in customer service, and they'll be able to help you. Ordering online doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be more expensive than if you go into Staples to buy what you're looking for. Um, let's see. people are asking about metal artifacts. Do you have any advice for them in terms of basic preservation? Well, no, because I'm not a metal specialist, so yeah. I can't be much help that way. But I know in the years past, I've been helping historical societies that often have mixed collections. Um, they sometimes end up with farm implements and all kinds of strange stuff that they're keeping in these old homes. Um, they're actually fairly safe to store in attics or on top floor 
of these old houses because it's usually warm and dry and metals tend to like that. Yeah, we just have to avoid humidity, right? Yeah, that's the big one. Okay. And acids from your hands mm -hmm. can sometimes cause problems to finishes. Um, there's a couple questions about textile storage as well, and I know we've had a webinar in the past that should be available um, through the LEX website on that. Do you want to address textile storage at all? How best to preserve a cloth sampler or a wedding dress? Those um kind of questions? Yeah, I would probably consult a specialist or look at another webinar. I mean, a lot of the basic things about using good quality enclosures and storing them in the right place still apply to those materials. But you should probably speak to someone who can really help you pack them correctly. And Mona is asking, how would you remove photographs from a magnetic photo album safely? <laughs> well, I have, I'm going to laugh because I had some too. And some, some of them, they came out really, really easily because the adhesive actually dried up and failed and they all fell out. And others, it kind of became really, really sticky and I wasn't, I wasn't really able to get them out. I probably would suggest, if you can, to uh, see if you can't get some good quality copies made before you try to remove them. But uh, there's not going to be an easy way. You might try, oh, here's a suggestion. Um, you might try using some uh, dental tape, you know, like dental floss, but dental tape, it's a little thicker. And just see if you can't wiggle that underneath and see if it comes up. Hmm. That's an interesting technique. Try to avoid the one with the minty flavor. <laughs> So I'm going to just ask two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, is the old rule of keeping everything in the basement four inches off of the floor sufficient? Uh, yeah, well, I like to say six, but yeah, keeping things off the floor in, in the basement where you're not supposed to store stuff uh, is always a good idea. And in libraries and archives, although four inches is the rule, six inches is even better. Okay, and then the last question, um, Ellen is asking, how do you feel about laminating? Uh, well, laminating is not for, for important collections. Laminating is for children's books and driver's licenses. Uh, rather than laminating, you can put something into a mylar sleeve, and this way you can take the object out with absolutely no harm to it at all, completely reversible. So you're just putting it into a mylar you know, enclosure, and you can see it, you can handle it, you can hold it, you can look at it, you can flip it back and forth, it has some protection, and then one day you can take it right out, if you have to. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Karen. Um, I think that's all we've got time for questions. We'll try to answer some of your other questions in some other way, if we can. Okay. Thank you, everyone been a pleasure. So Karen, I think, has provided some great practical tips. A lot of you are asking where you could get the slides or view her presentation later or share it with other people. Um, it will be available. Those of you who've registered for the presentation, you'll get an email link with a follow-up to um, the slides and the video later, um, as well as you can also go to the Alex webinar, that's ALCTS website, or the Alex channel on YouTube for more information and to view that once um, we've got the recording up and available. So for more information about preservation, please visit the American Library Association's Preservation Week website, where you can find more great tips and resources to help you preserve your family treasures. And if you have additional questions about preserving your family treasures that we weren't able to cover today, you can ask Preservation Specialist Donya Cohn your questions through the Preservation Week website as well, which you can see here, Dear Donya. Thank you again to today's sponsor, Archival Products. And last but not least, thanks to Eva Sorrell for her technical assistance today. We hope you'll join us for our next Preservation Week webinar, Preserving Scrapbooks with Melissa Tadone, this Thursday, May 1st.
And more information about these and other upcoming webinars, web courses, and e-forms can be found on the ELEX webinar website. We hope you found today's session helpful. You'll soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to fill it out and return it to us, and your comments will help us evaluate and plan future Preservation Week webinars. And again, if you're interested in viewing parts of the presentation again or sharing it with others, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording shortly after the conclusion of this webinar. The presentation will also be archived and freely available at the Alex webinar website and the Alex Continuing Education channel on YouTube. Thank you all again for joining us today. Goodbye.